Well, let's say bye. Goodbye. Well, let's say we will love. It's a dog. Oh, no, no. Congratulations, you made it. You know. You know. I need a clicker. <laughs> Sinead, you know. <laughs> this is my guide to you doing you. All us crazies gotta stick together. Always. Me? I'm proper crazy. I came to this realization a couple of years ago. I like to stick my tongue out in photographs. <laughs> but what I realized a couple of years ago is that actually, I really enjoy being me. I really love being a little bit of crazy. And not everybody gets to see my crazy. Some of you know. So some people ask me, Stephen, how did you end up this way? I said, nobody, never. So I'm going to bring in a little bit of a journey. So I was looking back at some of my childhood photographs the other day, and I realized that it looked like a bit of a sweaty golem. <laughs> That's me over there on the left. And as you can see, I still have not yet grown into my tongue. <laughs> I had a really good childhood. I was very, very, very shy child, and I hated school, hated it with a passion. I was thick as chump, that's what everybody told me, but it actually turned out that I was dyslexic. They stuck me to the front of the room, that didn't work. They put glasses on me, that didn't work. Found out, final year of university, in the last semester, you're dyslexic. Thanks. I was dragged to church, and I had a smart sister. My sister is super, super smart, right? She is like, like super smart. She could walk into this room. If you've had a problem, she'll fix it. That's just the way she is. And it was kind of like that, you know, whenever I was walking down the road and, you know, walking with my mom and there'd be someone come up to us as a family and they go, oh, Claire, what about you? How you doing? How's cello going? He's still playing. Are you still going down to play football with your brother and beating him? And I go, Stephen, you still doing that thing with your ears? <laughs> But what I found out was that self-belief is altered by the amount and severity of good and bad experiences you face and how you acknowledge them. And that was said by me just now. <laughs> so how do you acknowledge a moment? Well, for me, and this is very personal, it's about people, it's about the date and the time, it's about the feelings, it's about how you can change as a result, Google research, in skills and judgment and abilities. But change is not always immediate, but what you do is you remember all of these things which change you in terms of where your self-belief is. So here's my story. First of all, I'm going to talk about peers. Now, whenever I was younger, now obviously with my accent now it's a wee bit more mellow, but I used to sound like, you know, like uh, an angle grinder hitting the concrete for the first time. You know, hey, what about you? You all right? <laughs> I went to a bit of a rough school, <laughs> and uh, it was kind of, one of my friends said to me, you weren't brought up, you were dragged up. And uh, so, one of my biggest achievements, I was punching, not like the box earlier, proper punching, whenever I met my first girlfriend. And <laughs> she went to Methody, very, very posh, you know, she was from the hills. <laughs> and she said to me, she said, Stephen, I wouldn't get out of bed for anything less than 21 grand. <laughs> I thought to myself, right, okay, fair enough. And she goes, and see if you don't get that attitude, I'm going to dump you. <laughs> and I thought, right, okay, there's no more motivation here right now than to get out the course syllabus and look at things that I could do. And I didn't want to go to university, but she said, Stephen, what are you good at? I like playing football. <laughs> well, well, she says, we'll, we'll, we'll call it rugby, but <laughs> she says, how about you go to uh, university to do sports studies? 
And I said, okay, that works. Go and play football for three years. And I got a degree. Now, this story, the moral of, if someone hadn't have been pushing me at that point in time, I don't believe that I would be where I am today. So I remember the date back in 2003. I remember who was there. I remember the experience. I remember exactly what was said. I take that as a life-defining moment. I want to let you into a little bit of a secret. Some of you will know this, some of you won't. I did time. <laughs> the bird. Jail, prison. 2005, I went to Kenya, and I was very, very fortunate that I wanted to go out and do something alongside my university degree. So I brought out some sports equipment, sent it out to Kenya. Sports equipment never arrived. Phoned up customs, excuse me, I don't have my sports equipment. Back then, my Belfast just kicked in. You can take the boy out of Belfast, but you never kick, take the Belfast out of the boy. My Newton breed of high school kicked in. Excuse me, what are you telling me? You're holding me my sports equipment? <laughs> they told me I didn't have the right tax letter and I needed to go to the airport to try and release the, the, the sports equipment. So I got my taxi, shoulders back, chest out, and I went to the airport. And right then, whenever I went in, they said, you need to pay us X amount of money to release your sports equipment. I didn't have that sort of money. So they said, okay, follow us. Handcuffed, brought into a prison cell. Now I was freaking out, as you would. Girlfriend at the time, back in the apartment. She's worrying where I am. I'm sitting there for ages and I'm panicking, I'm freaking out, I'm going, what am I gonna do, what am I gonna do? I start to think I'm never going to get home. Next thing, this fella comes past the cell. Hey, I'm Rico. Rico from Mombasa. He was an agent. He said to me, don't worry, I'm going to bring you back to your apartment. Not a problem. You just give me your money. You pay what you need to pay to release the tax uh, certificate to get the sports equipment. And then I need a fee. So I was like, right, okay, that'll wipe out all of my savings that I had here. I'm going to have to go home. Got down to the apartment. Straight away, first person I met was this guy who traveled over from Belfast to do some dentistry, staying in the same apartment. Never met him before in my life. A guy called Bernard Jaffa. And Bernard, first thing he did, put his hand in his pocket, lifted out his wallet, and he paid Rico from Mombasa he paid him all of the money that was owed. Never met the guy before in my life. Now I'm privileged to say that Bernard is here tonight to listen to this story. Bernard, thank you very much. You're a part of my story. Oh, about the 50 quid. If it wasn't for Bernard, I'd still be in a prison cell in Kenya somewhere, so you've got him to thank, unfortunately. Uh, but that was a really ex a big experience for me. It was life-changing, and, and, and I remember that really fondly because I thought to myself, you know, no, no matter what happens, anywhere in the world I go right now, it can never be as bad as that. And I really, really enjoyed that trip. I went back in 2010, and there's Bernard there in the picture. The next one is inspirational people. Fast forwarding a couple of years, I got my first 21K job. I was happy. Wasn't talking to her though. <laughs> so I had a great boss at this organization that I work for, and some of you'll know it, so I can't say it in case I get sued. But what they do is they essentially phone up places to get uh, venues for free, they get speakers for free, and they get people to pay for their food and sponsor. And I thought this was crazy. But my boss at the time was unbelievable. She came in in the morning, sat down, got on her phone, lifted the phone, phoned people, and basically told them that they were gonna do this. And she taught me to have balls, to get on the phone, to phone people and just do stuff. And I'm really thankful to her. Again, kind of understanding that different mentality of business. I came from the third sector, worked in a lot of charitable organizations, and I never really understood that you could just ask for things. And things happened. 
And fast forward and again, I took that mentality into whenever I set up my business four years ago, Upskill Enterprise. And really my, my drive in setting up Upskill Enterprise is around understanding people. Um, and I didn't understand why I was setting up Upskill at the time. It actually only happened a couple of years ago whenever I realized I was crazy. That actually the reason I set it up is because people are magnificent. People have unbelievable talents, hidden talents that um, should be used, should be exposed, and should be um, harnessed in the best possible way. And in Northern Ireland, there's a lot of entrepreneurs here. And you guys will understand this. When you're starting up a business on your own, you can give somebody here a million reasons why it's a good idea to engage with you as a business. They will find the one reason why not. And I find that really, really difficult. And if you're not part of the right circles, you're not part of the right cliques, you're not connected to the right people, or you're not saying the right things, or you're not the flavor of the month, it's a very hard place to do business. It's an amazing place to do business, but a very, very difficult place to do business. And for me, I got on a plane and I went to America 18 months ago, about two years ago. I need to update my story. So two years ago, I got on a plane and went to America and I was introduced to this lady called Jerry Fiala. And I got to her because I picked up the phone to Norman Houston in the Northern Ireland Bureau and I said, Norman, this is what I'm doing. Do you know anybody? She says, I. <laughs> well, he, he's actually from Cumber. He said, yes, Stephen. <laughs> so I said, Norman, can you introduce me to uh, this person? I know you know. And I met with Jerry. Jerry Fiala is the former Assistant Secretary for the US Department of Labor. She started under Reagan. She retired under Obama. She is the fountain of knowledge in terms of anything to do with workforce around America. I met with her and I told her what my vision was, to build something to really support, help small businesses understand the talent that they have, how to utilize that better, and how to put and empower uh, the skill and talent of people at the forefront of what happens within industry. And she got behind me. She's now the chair of Upskill Enterprise. A part of that journey then, you can see some of the photographs. We've had, had some amazing times. I uh, brought the mayor of Philadelphia to Belfast, which was a big coup. Um, I have established my US company. Uh, it's been going now for uh, nearly a year. Uh, I fi hired, hired, fired, not hired, fired. <laughs> hired, not fired. My first American member of staff, Ann Lopez, and got her to drink a pint of Guinness in Missouri. Um, I'm working with the US Department of Labor and I've signed a, a distribution agreement with the National Association of Workforce Boards and I have secured deals in Michigan, Missouri, Texas and uh, I think coming up shortly in uh, Connecticut as well. For me, yeah. thank you. for me all of the experiences I had about getting on a plane and just doing, doing what I, I needed to do and asking people the right things and just taking the confidence to go and do that has really changed my life dramatically. But what was my changing and defining moment? And you remember the people, the date, the feelings and how I changed the result as a result. And it was a couple of years ago that I was thinking about this and, and again it brought it up while I was uh, uh, making this presentation. And for me, it was about how I define why I like people and why I believe in what I do so much. And this comes back to whenever I was a bit of a bully bait, is what I'll call it, back whenever I was a wee bit of a regret in school. Right? You know the way you've got different tiers of people in school? You've got like your, your kind of your, your geeks, and then you've got your, your smart people who are still a wee bit geeky but cool, and you've got your people who are kind of nonchalant, moving through life and all good. Then you've got the mom, <laughs> the mom at the top. He's a fella that absolutely nobody messes with. He is the bully of the bully, the one you want to stay away from, right? So back whenever I was about 13, 14, I uh, had a role model in my life and somebody who's really, really important to me. And unfortunately, we had a bereavement and we lost her. And it broke my heart. She was like one of the leading lights in my life. She brought me away from being this small introverted person to being somebody who had self-belief. 
She would ask me about my life. She would ask me about what I was doing in school. I went into school the next day whenever I found out that, uh, that uh, we lost her. And I went in and I sat down in the cloakroom. And I was sitting there. And I, you know the feeling when you're lost? You just don't know what's going on. And you, like everything is just falling away from you. And I felt this presence beside me. And this arm went round my shoulder. It was a man. <laughs> and this fella sat down and he put his arm around me and he gave me the biggest hug I've ever had in my life. And he said, Stephen, I heard what happened last night. He says, if you need anything, you come and talk to me. And you know what? That's my defining moment because that's when I realized that everybody has something, has someone. Self-belief is altered by the amount and severity of good and bad experiences you face and how you react to them. That was again said by me 15 minutes ago. <laughs> you do you. You are perfect. Take that self-belief that you have now, tonight, from everything that you've heard. Take it into the world. And please know that everybody has a purpose. Everybody has that inner belief. Take that knowledge and you do you. Thank you very much.